Welcome back to Karuna Satori Basic. My name is Karuna, and you're watching the Disney Channel. No, but seriously. <laughs> Funny enough, today's video is going to be a story time and or talk about how last year my husband and I almost got divorced permanently. <laughs> so... Like I said, funny enough, right before that, I was like, hey, babe, can you bring me out this hoodie? Because I wanted to show you all the copyrighted, busted, cheap ass hoodie I had made on Etsy. Please do not get, unless it's YouTube licensed official, like uh, my husband got me an actual Google YouTube hoodie for Christmas and I'm so scared to wear it because I know it'll be covered in cat hair, cigarette ashes and like broken my hair all over it. So I was like, can you bring this out? And I was like, could you also please bring me out a cup of tea? And I was like thinking in my head, oh, he'll bring me it out in like a nice glass or something. <laughs> he brings it out in my daughter's birthday cups from last year. And it's still even after all of the washes, dishwashing, hand washing, says mommy on it. And I was just like, that's great, babe. Thanks so much. But that goes with what I want to talk about today. So This has a pretty good ending to the story, but things were not this good at one time. If you're new here and you don't know anything about me, you can follow along with this story. Um, you're probably going to have no fucking idea what's going on, and I don't blame you, so maybe go find a little bit more forward advice about divorce and relationships and things like that. But for those who have been with me will kind of understand uh, the story and like a little bit about my husband and me. But like I said, it kind of works for everybody if you don't mind the babbling in the meantime. So with that being said, I guess let's get into it. Um, so I met my husband. This is why it's just such a shit show. I met my husband in, in a methadone clinic um, in 2011. Uh, yes, I am a recovering addict. Uh, I am successfully clean now, technically clean nine years or actually going on 10 years since it was 2011 that I chose to join the methadone clinic, but since detox and everything else. So anyway, I met him during a group. Um, I was the type of person, and I'm just going to be real, I want this video to be as raw and real as possible even though it kind of throws myself under the bus, but you know what? That's a good thing because I shouldn't be ashamed to talk about my shitty decisions and how I ended up learning from those decisions because I'm the type of person who always chooses to take the hard way out. If there is an easy road, I can just, for example, filming for me is a perfect example. There's people like ASMR GB out there who like, she pre-films all of her videos, okay? This woman does just work all day every day she's either streaming she's filming she's doing sponsors she's doing brand deals she's doing putting her shit on spotify she's having an editor a assistant whatever she her husband is literally my manager that goes to show that like <laughs> anyway um and then i'm over here making my life so difficult to where i procrastinate to film all the way up until something is due like a sponsor that will put food on my table and i wait until the very last minute to turn it in perfect example how I take the hard way out with everything. So growing up, I've always taken the hard way out with men or women or even in between. Damn, I mean, but back then I never really met anybody. So it was always just men, basically, that I would just allow to treat me like shit. And I often wonder if it was because of being, you know, molested at a very young age, uh, raped when I was 18, just finding the utmost fucking shittiest people to stick their dicks in me, like, just absolutely terrible. And, um, it grew until I started getting into drugs, uh, just always, it was always somebody who just didn't give a fuck about me. So when I finally chose to get clean off of methadone, or clean off of drugs, that's later on, but clean off of drugs, I went to the methadone clinic, and I was seeing my ex, uh, Kevin, at the time. He doesn't care if I talk about him. He's great. He's still in my life. He's a good friend of mine to this day, but him and I were not compatible. We were just not compatible. It's almost like we were together for two years simply because we were a good team in getting drugs. We were a good team at putting other people down, robbing them, treating them like shit. It was just an absolute fucking shit show like this whole story. And that's terrible. It's terrible to talk about. It's, you know, it's funny that I'm laughing now and stuff, but I heard a lot of people in the process being an addict. And, you know, over the years, 
they say that whenever you start drugs, your brain, uh, like once you start getting addicted, your brain is stunted and you're stuck in that age. And ultimately, I often believe that's true because <laughs> I really got into drugs late seven at the age of 17. And, you know, I have a lot of um, coping mechanisms and ways that I lash out when I'm angry and, and things like that that are childish. And it seems that I've never grown from that, but I've learned to subdue that kind of shit. So <laughs> moving on. Anyway, so Kevin and I were together. This is right before I met Victor, my current husband, my husband for going on nine years in March. Kevin and I got into the clinic and when you get yourself into a methadone clinic or any type of uh, treatment for drug addiction, your whole life changes because you're spending all of that time with somebody that you claim that you love, robbing people and finding drugs. You never really have time to spend time with that person and know what love is. You know, the most love that I got during that relationship was like him not snorting one of my, you know, pills whenever it was out. Like he'd always take more of mine and everything. You know what I mean? That was his his type of showing love. And we call that love language in real life, but <laughs> I'll get into it. I'm sorry with the jokes. Okay. I ended up getting into methadone maintenance and Kevin and I were just no longer compatible. Okay. We were so bored. We're just laying around all day sleeping. I was living at my dad's house when he was alive. I was literally a child going on, you know, 20 years old, whatever. So one day, you know, one requirement in the methadone clinic is you have to take groups. And I'm over here like, fuck this. I just want to get my take home so I can sleep more. <laughs> this was before I had kids, before I knew about YouTube, anything. Um, and ultimately, one day, uh, we almost missed that group. I remember I was late. And usually him and I went to groups together because I didn't have a license. I had absolutely shit to my name. And he was taking me every morning, Kevin, to the clinic. So him and I were pretty much on the rocks. And again, as I stated earlier, I just hopped from one person to another when I was younger. I just didn't care. I, you know what I mean? Like I was a cheater. I was a piece of shit just coming off of drugs. And that day I had to go to group alone. And I don't, I, to this day, I specifically don't remember what group it was, but he dropped me off that morning and I went in and this is like, it's a sweet story because, you know, it's just like, I go in and I'm trying not to ramble off. I sit down um, and nobody sat by me. I used to like, I wish I could find a picture. I want to find a picture, but I want this to be raw and real. I don't want to edit this. I don't want to cut it. Um, I sit down and nobody sat by me <clears throat> and there were like two guys and like three girls. Maybe I'm just kind of making this up because I don't really remember, but I do remember Victor. I'd never seen this guy in my whole life. He'd been going there for a year. It turned out I was going there, you know, for about a couple months at that point. And he sat by me. He was the only person who sat by me, okay? And I'm the type of person who would always, like, apply my personality to the situation. So what that means is, for example, the story now, during the group, I wanted to make myself appear intelligent, to appear, to appear on top of everything, on top of the group. So <clears throat> the director was talking. And I remember it was a female and she was like, well, what do you guys do for your pastimes now? And Victor, like, he just sat next to me and he was wearing this, like, ugly, they call them wife beaters or whatever, the white, like, tank tops. I don't know why they call them that. Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I, like, I don't know. People still say that. It, I hope that's not a wrong thing to say. If it is, I truly am sorry. Wife beater. Is that what they call it? Is that a real thing? He's wearing a white wife beater. This man is as pale as shit. Looks like he's so skinny. I wasn't wearing any makeup. My shirt was like all pulled out from a fight I had gotten into with Kevin like a few days beforehand. Physical altercations, just chaos. And, you know, he raised his hand and he was like, I like books. I like to read. I like to listen to music. I like to play music. And for some reason in my head, I don't know that day, I was just like, I feel the need to talk to this man. Like, I feel the need to make myself known to him. I don't know. Maybe I just want him to fuck me for validation. I don't know. Because like, again, that's what I used to do. Um, and then I raised my hand after and I just started talking, like trying to manipulate myself with him. Okay. And I, I did. And then, you know, when things were quiet, they gave us an, the guy or the woman gave us an assignment at the end of the group, like to write down our stuff, like what we plan to do to continue our maintenance and everything and avoid drugs. 
And I saw this tattoo he had on his hand. And let me tell you right now, it. I thought, and <laughs> to this day, I have some shitty tattoos, okay? But this, Victor's fucking tattoo, it's um, a map of Stonehenge or Hedge or whatever. It's literally hand-drawn. It's the hand-drawn map of Stonehenge or whatever, Hedge. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and I look over at him and I'm like, I really like your wrist tattoo. Even though in my head, I'm like, this is the shittiest fucking tattoo I have ever seen in my life. And he's like, oh, thank you. And, you know, him and I started talking. I have never had, I've never spoken to another guy. I've never, you know what I mean? It was so weird. And we start talking and, you know, it was just really sweet. And he was like, yeah. And the group ended and like, we kind of followed each other outside where Kevin was waiting in his prelude car. Like, this is so sad. I promise you, I did not hurt this man. Like, this is just ridiculous. So I go out and Kevin was sitting right in front of the door and I was still talking to him. And I was like, in my head, I felt like I needed to go with him or I just, I wanted to leave with this man that I just met. I looked at who looked like he was dying. Like, I was just like, I need to be in the presence of this human. And I remember he had one of his work cards. He used to work at a screen printing company right by that methadone clinic. Um, And he was like, I have to go to work, but if you'd ever like to talk some more. And he wrote down his number and he gave it to me. And that was it, man. Kevin saw that and drove away and left me there. (laughs) This is terrible. He just left me there. He saw me talking to another guy and just like pulled out. He's like, fuck this bitch. And I do not blame him. But anyway, um, and I was like, do you, I was like, could you give me a ride home? And he was like, no, I got to go to work. (laughs) That's what's even funnier is like this, my current boyfriend at the time leaves me there because he saw me talking to another guy. This guy couldn't give me a ride home. And I'm just like, well, who can I fucking manipulate into taking me home now? So anyway, um, after that, Kevin and I ended up breaking up because I ended up calling Victor and we spoke on the phone and there was a lot of nitty gritty shit that we're 12 minutes in. And if I tell you this shit, you are just going to be like, what in the hell? But let me tell you this, um, for the first all the way up until getting pregnant, which actually was only about six months later. Um, and even into that, you know, that, that is what is difficult to talk about is our relationship because of my choices, because of my, just overall uncare and like that love deep down in me somewhere but the I guess um what what do they call that trauma response maybe I don't know of treating other people like shit before they can treat me like shit always stuck and Victor dealt with a lot of shit from me going into our relationship for years even up until our kids were taken in 2015 you know what I mean like I cheated on him once um, whenever we got together. We got married 2012. Yeah, about a year later. And we got married on my grandmother's birthday. And it's just really like fucked up to talk about because my dad died and there was just a lot of nitty gritty. But he dealt and he put up with a lot of shit for me. And I wasn't used to the love that he gave me. In fact, like where I was going with the story is that it was so hard for me to. I got to I got to get my words together. I have to cut this. OK, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to keep that clip in like of me smoking, but I it's hard to get my words together because it's hard to think about now where I was and the way that I acted and the person I used to be because I treated Victor in the beginning like shit. And I did not think in fact, he was more of a rebound because of all the things that happened with my previous ex Kevin and to this day him and Kevin are very good friends like they talk they whatever but it's difficult because like I said earlier my response to everything was always to treat people like shit and not let them get anywhere in here where all that suffering was from and Victor was the first man I ever met in my whole life to show me a hundred percent pure un filtered raw ass love to the core man and don't get me wrong for the first couple years in our marriage or in our relationship you know there was a lot of things he was going through too and to this day he's still opening up to me about his childhood his 
this man has been through fucking hell and I have been as well growing up and we all have a story. We've all been through hell. All of us at one point or another, I'm sure, have been abused in some way and been the abuser in other ways mentally, you know, physically even. It's terrible to say, but a lot of recovering addicts have a lot of bad stories and I do. You know, I have those and so does Victor. So in the first couple years of our relationship, in the first year, um, two years of our marriage, it was in it was right. It was the year my children were removed. Um, I think in March, I went to Washington, D.C. with another YouTuber and cheated on my husband. Um, I felt after having my daughter um, in 2014. So I guess it was three years technically since we met sort of. No, not really. Whatever. Um, but it was a while in that I felt after having kids, and this is where everything kind of goes, that my husband didn't want to touch me anymore. And this is a thing I know a lot of people in marriages or relationships go through. I know it. I've spoken to tons and tons of people over it. Um, I felt that he didn't want to look at me anymore. I felt that he didn't want to physically touch me or love me. There was a lot of problems going on. My husband was working 12-hour days. Um, I was home with the kids, handing them off to his mother all the time because I didn't want to face the reality that I was a mother or I didn't want to face my father's death. I didn't want to face my depression. I didn't want to face my mental problems. I could keep going. So I met a YouTuber online. Um, at the time, he was a very well-known YouTuber. Now he's a QAnon fucking conspiracy theorist. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, these people that I have been with physically, <laughs> insanity. And I went to DC with this man for a weekend. And I will never forget sitting there getting ready to cheat on my husband. And I had an iPad at the time. I didn't have a phone. Um, I took his iPad with me. My husband knew I was going to DC with another man and he did not stop me. Um, and I went and I was in the hotel room and he was FaceTiming the iPad and it is so painful as somebody who cheated. I did this and I made this mistake and this is hard for me to talk about because I don't know. I mean, I've been very open about cheating um, because I, and this goes with a long and I'll get into it. But anyway, <sighs> um, he FaceTimed me and he FaceTimed me and he FaceTimed me and he FaceTimed me and I cheated on my husband. And I remember getting back from that trip and he was heartbroken as he should be. And from then on out, things were just different. Um, it's almost like he wanted to show that love and he wanted to be there for me and he wanted to be open and everything like that. And it broke him. It broke his heart. I don't think that this man who was so pure and gentle and real to me um, could ever understand the feeling of somebody he loved hurting him as bad as I hurt him. And when I chose to make that decision, um, I thought in my head that um, that, you know, because he wasn't touching me that I needed to go find somebody else to do it for me. And um, we both hurt each other in the end. So after that, we moved out of a very, our, you know, the kids situation happened and we had to move out. We were evicted from our home. Um, I went to live in another place, a town over. And my husband and I came to the decision we were going to start being um, a little open this was late 2015, early 2016, that um, about almost about a year later that we decided we were going to kind of start being in an open relationship where I could see who I want sexually and he could see who he wanted sexually. But the only stipulation to that is that there would be no love. There would be no hanging out after. There would be nothing. Um, I'm very lucky that I did not get any STDs. I'm very lucky for the uh, reckless behavior that I showed, the reckless behavior that he showed. And I really think somebody who was so pure when I cheated on him that he turned reckless as well. 
And I feel like I'm skipping over a lot of serious issues that went on in our relationship because of how tainted, tainted, how broken, how mentally unstable I was at the time before hitting rock bottom. Losing my kids was hitting rock bottom and it happened in May of 2015, um, a few months after I cheated on my husband when everything was going downhill that we were in such a bad fucking place that we were just holding on to one another at that point after my poor decisions and soon to be his poor decisions. And it was a fucking mess. It was a mess. And that is why I said in the beginning, if you don't know who I am, you won't be able to follow along. For strangers, it's probably easy for you guys to look at me and think, wow, you are a big piece of shit for cheating on your husband at first. And yes, I absolutely agree at the time. I had no care for anybody in this world. Nobody. Not even myself. No fucking care. Not a fucking shit. My dad was taken away from me. Just the only man who truly ever loved me. I thought um, that I said, fuck it. (laughs) We're just going to give up. We moved to another place, like I said, um, started the whole open relationship and did that for like two years, two, almost three years. Then we're in like late 2018 and things are changing. Um, We were forced to get our shit together and we were in such a bad place. And honestly, after all this time being with my husband, it feels like our relationship didn't truly start until like 2018, if that makes sense. It feels like things weren't starting to get real until that time. We got our kids back in January of 2017, a year and a half, almost two years. I always say it's two years because the state remained in our lives six years or six months later that things, you know, were starting to get better. And I started YouTube and I always speak about how YouTube saved my life and everything like that. And this is, I am in such a bad mental headspace now because I'm thinking of all the negative things that occurred, but I feel like it's important for what I'm going to say soon. In 2018, things started really going well for me. Um, Whenever my kids were taken, I was forced to do all kinds of state-regulated mental health evaluations, psych evaluations. And funny enough, uh, after doing two psych evaluations or the psychology test where they like do all that shit, I passed both with flying colors. I don't know how. I really don't know how. I didn't lie on that test. Like if people are like, you know what I mean? Like then I, I, (laughs) what world are we living in? But anyway, um, (laughs) just try to throw a little humor in there. Um, my husband didn't have to work 12 hour days anymore. I was filming every single day. We were a happy, happy, intact family. And I think whenever we finally decided to get out of all the icky, nasty, yucky shit uh, regarding like me cheating, um, him seeing women after I cheated on him and opened up a whole new realm of like us agreeing to be in an open relationship with, that we were fine with, but at the same time weren't fine with because no matter what, we always found some type of jealousy in each other of why we couldn't just find that love in each other. And I feel like since day one, my husband showed that love to me, but I wasn't ready to accept it because of my trauma and my past and everything else and my responses to everything because like I said my response was always to either have somebody fuck me for validation or me um just being a piece of shit to somebody else because I didn't want to let them in and I put him through hell man I put that man through fucking hell and back until we just until I decided to change me me until I decided to change okay and I did. Um, Like I said, started filming every day. I had a whole YouTube family. I had people telling me things about myself I never would believe. And to this day, it's still very hard to believe. Like, I'm a good person or, you know, you've helped me or you saved my life with your ASMR or your story or something like that. And I'm over here thinking, what the fuck? Like, I am not that person. I am ashamed of who I am and I hate myself. And I don't want to tell anybody how much I hate myself. And my husband was the only person who held me at night and believed in me and read to me when I was going through things. And we just decided one day to 
cut it out and cut the shit out and just start being serious with one another. And like I said, it feels like our marriage truly started in 2018. And from then on out, it started becoming more realistic and raw and we were getting more comfortable with each other. And we had only been together for six years at that time. Two, 18, 20, 21. Yeah, I guess. Um, so we'd been through a lot of shit together and that was nice. And then I started to find myself opening up and getting to know this man and him finally starting to open up and feeling like we could rebuild the shit storm that we had just put ourselves through, me especially. And I felt so comfortable more and more every day. That man did not see me fully naked until I birthed my son. My first child is when my man or when my husband first saw me naked. That's how insecure and fucked up the shit is from the trauma in my past that I choose not to talk about. Um, and things were great. And then um, 2019 rolls around and, you know, we start having problems because now it's like we got out of the crazy lifestyle of poverty and, um, you know, irrational mental health and like it's just insanity, fucking insanity of like both of our crazy decisions and decisions to try to make each other happy that were just piss poor decisions. And, you know, since getting our kids back, we were like, OK, we have to be these good people and good parents. And thank you, Jesus Christ. At least I was able to become the mother to my children I was supposed to. But at the same time, my husband and I still had a rocky road ahead of us. But like I said, things started getting really good. Um, 2019, I cleared all of my debt. I purchased our first home together, a car with cash, a brand new fucking car with cash, things that I never thought would happen to me in my life. And things were great. But unfortunately, no matter what, I found in marriage, things will go wrong no matter what. It, it's just, it's inevitable. It's always a system where you're going to go through good phases, like very happy, loving, cuddly, in, in depth, deep love phases. And he kind of fades out to like, eh, I don't want to really hang around you right now. And then that fades out to absolutely stay the fuck away from me for a few days kind of thing. And that's great and all, but then we started finding out that those lows were really low compared to the highs that were really high, if that makes sense. So the lows, you know, we were just getting irritated with one another. And I started going through this period um, last year, which is whenever I finally started talking about divorce, where it felt like my husband wanted nothing to do with me again, physically. Um, I just, I don't get it. I don't know what it is in me that still believes that. I don't know because, excuse me, I feel like Gordon Ramsay or my husband's Gordon Ramsay and I am the idiot sandwich and he's just screaming in my face like, I love you and I want you physically. And, you know, it's just hard for me to accept that maybe not all the time people want to do it or I'm, you know, I don't know. But it turns out that um, just... I don't, I, I just, I felt like he didn't want me. And there were days that we were going where he just didn't talk to me or anything. And I was like, why won't you talk to me? Like, what's going on? Like, and we got into this huge fight finally one day. And he was just like, I am so bored with my life. Like, he's like, I have nothing going on. I, I can't find you know, any joy in anything other than my kids. And I, I took that to heart and I, it was very personal and it was so real because all the fights that we used to have were like, uh, can I buy a pack of cigarettes with your bank card? And he's like, no, because he was the only one working at the time. And just a lot of this and that and just petty, immature shit, you know, getting to know each other as a recovering, as both recovering addicts. And, you know, being put in a motherhood and like losing a parent and things like that. And it just kind of built up to where I was literally crying myself to sleep every single night, um, wondering why my husband didn't want to put his arm around me and hold me or why my husband didn't look at me in the face whenever I was getting ready. And like, I'd come down and I'd, you know, have makeup on and he wouldn't look at me or why I, you know, would dress up and my husband just wouldn't touch me or feel intimate with me. And it was scary because we had been through so much at this point 
And I always say that it's my own torture that I put myself through for cheating on him. I always say that in my head and I believe it to this day, even though he's made it very clear that that's not the point or not true, that because I cheated on this man, I have forever burnt a hole in in our trust with each other, okay? Forever bro- taken something sacred and just flushing it down the fucking toilet. And I say that's my, that is my punishment, is my own mental state going over in my head that he doesn't want me because I was with someone else at one time without his consent or, you know, he was with someone else without my consent. And it's just fucking chaos. Okay. So anyway, we were just going through a period where he didn't seem to want to be with me. He didn't want to do anything with me when my mother would watch our kids for a weekend. He didn't want to go anywhere. And I was doing everything that I possibly could. I surprised him with beach trips. I surprised him with, you know, things I could buy or uh, wrote him little love letters and he wasn't responding to any of it. And this was only in a couple month period. Like, don't get me wrong. But it was really hard on my mental state because I felt like we were at we hit a wall where we couldn't talk to each other. I mean, we had been together at this point for eight years, maybe seven and a half if it's not hitting eight yet, because and I was scared. And at the same time, I was feeling more hurt, more hurt. I wasn't filming. I stopped wearing makeup because I was like, well, if he doesn't want to love me with makeup, then he doesn't have to love me without makeup either. And it became an insecurity issue. If he doesn't want to fuck me, I'm going to go, you know, fuck myself on camera for other people. And that's how deep rooted this shit is. That's how intense this stuff is. And I want to make a disclaimer that although I'm being very real and raw with my emotions right now, which I haven't done in a very long time on YouTube in front of people. I stopped giving off my emotional, deep-seated, fucking insecure shit to people because they take that shit and flip it around. Trisha Paytas is a perfect fucking example to that story with what uh, her some wig guy did to her. It's a perfect example of how people can take your insecurities and use them against you like that. That's why I stopped doing it. That's why I quit OnlyFans. It's it's so intense. But I feel like it's important for people to understand that sometimes it's your mind playing tricks on you. And it took a long time for me to understand that and, you know, help myself cope with that and get help for that. So last year, after all of this, finally, I was like, my husband is not showing me any affection anymore. I'm too fucking down in the dumps to go cheat on him again. I, 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 I remember in my head, I'm like, if he doesn't want to do it with me, if he doesn't want to touch me, I'm going to go get somebody else to do it. And that's not that I, I couldn't do it. Cause at the same time I was like, well, I don't want anybody to touch me. I want my husband to touch me. I love my husband because I started off with a wall in front of him. And now I'm so vulnerable and opening up to him. I was like, And he doesn't want me now for opening up. I was like, fine, then we'll get a divorce. And I made two phone calls. I called a lawyer in a local town. It's called Somerset County um, next to Cambria County. And I called a divorce lawyer over there um, and I left a message and they didn't call me back. And they never called me back to this day. And time went on and I was like, okay, maybe they didn't call me back for a good reason. And the second time was all the way up until September of last year. Um, Wasn't that far away from, you know, recently to where I finally got a hold of somebody locally and I spoke to them and they talked about how I would have to file forms and how all this, how messy, you know, instead of like, and I really admire this person. I don't want to talk about them, but they really explained to me. They're like, are you sure you want to start this process? And how, how are you guys, how are you going to approach him to split? How are you going to approach him to, you know, and then, and then I didn't even care at the time. I was like, I'm so fucking tired of not being appreciated or touched or loved or wanted or anything like that. You know, I'm tired of making it out to be like we're fucking a good couple on social media. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of not being myself. And then they brought up my fucking kids (laughs) and said, how is your family? 
and I explained how good and intact and cozy and happy and, and sweet it is that my kids run to both mommy and daddy instead of one parent now. Like, and they're like, are you sure you want to drag your children into a divorce that could potentially damage them for the rest of their lives? And I was like, aren't you supposed to be telling me like how aren't you supposed to be getting thousands of dollars off of me like you know what I mean but it really hit me hard and I said I don't know I have to think about that and then they explained you know the process of divorce and how it's not just a one-day thing especially if Victor chose to not sign the papers and it happened with my mother and father and like how he could come after me because I cheated on him it was very real raw and deep and Victor I'm like picking my nail because I'm so anxiety ridden talking about talking about this I'm like really dizzy talking about this um and yeah we had a blowout fight and I brought it up I said I talked to a lawyer I said, we're getting a divorce. And this was one night, one night late September. The kids were in bed and we went outside and we had a fire and I brought it up to him. And it's, it's almost like that word alone is what fucking blew everything up. It's almost like saying like, we're getting a divorce that really like hit him or like, you know, got him in the heart where he was like, what? Like, are you fucking serious? And that night we broke down together. And it's almost like that night brought all of this realization and all of this intense soul searching that I was looking for all along that I found in myself if this even makes sense I don't know we're 40 minutes in my face is really hot I'm really anxiety ridden talking about this and it's almost as if that night me saying that really fucking ripped open the wounds that him and I had maybe as we were younger and our responses to things as I spoke about ripping open those walls or breaking down those walls where we could just talk to each other and be real with one another and I wanted to know why I'm like why won't you touch me why won't you physically hold me and he's like I'm depressed and he's like I feel like I I have nothing in my life and he's like I feel like you don't want me because you have your online life and you aren't with me and like it's amazing how intense our talking was realistically when we both just heard each other for the first time because let me tell you when my husband and I would fight a while ago, it was always one side go. I was yelling at him. It was going in one ear out the other until he was allowed to talk. And then he, the only time he would listen was to himself. And the same with me. Anytime I had something to say, it was me. Just me listening to myself ramble. Like right now. <laughs> and it wasn't like that that night. And it hasn't been like that since. And I'm very open to say that, you know... Him and I had a lot of deep-seated shit we needed to talk about, about his childhood, about my childhood, about my sexuality and insecurities and, and letting my, minds play, or my mind play tricks on me that weren't there when he's, you know, he was just feeling a certain way and it had nothing to do with my physical appearance and I'm over here getting all kinds of surgeries and everything to try to please him and it, it's, it's, you know, whenever he never wanted me to get them in the... And it's, it's crazy. I could sit here and go on and on and on and on. But my best advice that I could have just said in the beginning and ended the video, but I think that if I didn't, then I wouldn't have a lot of things to talk about to try to understand that, like, you know, people have issues and they're deep-seated issues and people are people and they keep a lot of this shit private, but I'm known for not keeping anything private. So I feel like I could talk to you guys <laughs> is that from that day on, you know, we've had a little bit of tussle here and there, but from that fucking day on, my husband and I have been inseparable, closest we've ever been after nine years. Don't get me wrong. They say it takes seven years before you truly know somebody. I feel like I always hug that man 
and I feel like I just want to push myself through him. Does that make sense? I hug him and I just want to be inside of this man. I just want to so I want to be in him. I want to be him. I I am he's me. He's we are each other. We found out so many things over the past couple months and from a while and just knowing each other now and loving each other now. Not that we never did before, but that pure, raw, unadulterated love that I'm able to give that I was never able to give ever in my life because I never, ever knew in my life that somebody wanted to love me the way that that man loves me. And same to him. Like he got, he almost got pregnant. Um, well, no, his ex-girlfriend almost got pregnant. Um, they, it was a scare. It turns out she wasn't. And he told her, I don't want to have kids with you. I don't want to have kids with anybody. And then he met me and I got pregnant and he wanted to have kids with me. And, you know, that says something that I am worth it. And, you know, I'm thinking about all this time I wasted fighting with this man at one point and all these horrible things that we have both done to each other, but more I'm always thinking about me. Um, that it's not like that. It didn't have to happen. Or maybe it did, you know, maybe it did so we could be as close as we are today and loving as we are today. But all it took is a little communication and communication is so hard in a relationship. It's so fucking difficult. It's so difficult to talk about. So fucking difficult, man. I don't know. If you can talk to your partner and just be real and be raw and be unadulterated and feel comfortable enough. And I always say that you'll know true love with comfort, with comfort. I'm so tired of like fucking shows like The Bachelor, even though they're hilarious to watch and fun. And it's not how it works. It's not the shit that you see in the movies. It's called love language. I I never knew this thing existed until recently. It's called love language. My husband shows me his love language through, um, like get bringing me a fucking YouTube hoodie and a a dumbass fucking cup with mommy on it. (laughs) That is his love language. His love language is picking up after me and like taking care of me and reading me to sleep at night. Um, That is his love language. And my love language is rubbing his back and being physically affectionate towards him and listening to him and holding him at night when nobody's ever hold, held him his entire life. And my love language is complimenting him all the time and buying him everything and anything he wants and giving him his quote unquote masculinity back and us doing things that we could never do. That is my love language. And when our love languages intertwine and become together, we are the fucking on top of the world. And it's not, it's not fake. And it's not, um, like, what do you call that? Uh, Because I uh, have borderline personality disorder, meaning that my emotions are very high and very low. It's not those kinds of highs and lows. It's just real, comfortable, consistent happiness and contentness. And I have never in my life, I am almost 30 years old in my life. I have never been content. I never knew what that was. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, even not having any money and being able to have my kids back and us being a family and before all this crazy shit, because I'm not going to sit here and say that things were always bad. It's just things had to boil up to a certain point before we decided like, hey, some shit's really wrong here. And I made the decision to call a lawyer who I thank God for. Because they could have easily been like, oh, well, you know, put down this four grand and then we'll go to court. You can pay the court fees and all the filing fees and the time it takes to talk to me. They could have easily done that, but they didn't. The first lawyer never called me back. The second one did and gave me some real ass, real life questions and considerations before I chose to go through it. And I'm very grateful. I want to cut off this video here and I would like to make a part two. I want to see how this video does with all the shit that I talked about and very real, raw, and open about. I want to see the feedback of it. Um, 
I want to, I want, I want honesty. I hope that you guys comment down below. Um, I know it seems so negative, but now it's not like that. It's not like that. There's so many stories off of stories. It's been nine years that him and I have been together. It's been a lot of good, good, good things, including now, but also a lot of bad, bad things, you know, and that's in every relationship and every marriage. And I feel like we've been together this fucking long. And this man to this day loves me, loves me, like not likes me or tolerates me. This man fucking loves me. He loves me. And if I can truly look past the deepest, darkest fucking realms of my soul that I have never shown anybody in the world, and I can look past that and past the blinders and past the mind playing tricks and everything else and see him and his love for me, I promise one day if you're going through it that you will too and it'll be. And that's it. Um, that's why I want to make a part two, because I want to talk about actual, like, divorces and, like, feeling. And I've never been through that divorce, but almost. And I want to talk about, like, being together this long and how I truly knew and all this. But I want to see how this video does first. So please comment down below your feelings. But I will. It's all we're almost at 49 minutes. Um, I'm going to get this video uploaded and put out and I would like honest feedback family. So thank you for hearing me. It's been a really long time since I've got on here and been real with you guys, real nitty gritty fucking raw with you guys. And I'm okay with that. You know, for a whole year I've, I've been scared. I've been so scared of people. So fucking scared of people and creators but when you're your full 100% authentic self, the best of your ability, I mean, what can go wrong, right? <laughs> no. But all right, you guys, um, let me know what you think of this. Let me know what you think of this story. And then we'll make a part two and get into the main part. <laughs> Always trailing off. I love you, family. Bye.